Good morning. Great to see all of you and for us to be gathered here today. Uh, what a beautiful day it is for us. And uh, as we are uh, getting all ready for worship, we got a couple of announcements we want to lift up. Uh, the, the first of which, if you would uh, like to purchase a, an Easter lily uh, on behalf of, uh, in memory or honor of someone, you can do that through our church website uh, to go online to do that. If you have trouble doing that, you can call up to the church office and there's someone who can help do that for you or coach you through that if that's what you would like. Um, also, uh, at 9.45 today in Wesley Hall, so just down in the, the entry, we're going to have a, a, a church gathering. We're going to have breakfast there, like refreshments will be served, and well, bagels and all that kind of stuff. But uh, uh, as, as we, we meet, we're going to be talking about uh, how we as a congregation move out of this period of, of COVID into a, a new season. And so that's the... Uh, uh, the title for the presentation, A New Season, Growth for Tomorrow, how we uh, move forward into the next chapter for us as a congregation. So uh, I want to invite all of you to come and to attend, and, and I think you'll find it a, an, an interesting presentation. Um, of course, we're uh, quickly approaching uh, Holy Week and Easter soon, and uh, so we want to encourage you to make plans to be a part of those services uh, as we, we move forward. Uh, now, as we are gathered here, let us open our hearts, our minds, our spirits as we are tuned to God's presence with us in worship. You stand for the call to worship if you're able. Come to sit at the feet of Jesus to worship and hear God's message for you. Jesus is worth much more than our earthly treasures. God has done great things for us and is doing a new thing among us now. We come not because we are righteous but because our faith compels us to stand with Christ. The power of Christ's resurrection is ours to proclaim and to share. Forgetting what lies behind, we press toward the goal of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ.
I invite you to be seated and let us join together in our congregational prayer. Giver of the most precious gift of all, help us to learn from you. May we who are so adept at catering our own wants make ourselves more vulnerable to the needs of others. Let us live unselfishly and more sensitively that we may spread God's fragrance wherever the odor of cynicism and despair hangs in the air. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. Let us pray. God of light, we have heard your message proclaimed of old, that in you there is no dark at all. Nothing exists that can hide the light of your presence. Forgive us when we cling to the shadows, failing to heed your call to wake up, and join the work of your reign. We pray this morning, Lord, today for the people of Ukraine and ask that you be with them through this horrific war. Send us out into the world to do your deeds of mercy and peace, to feed the hungry, shelter the homeless, touch the sick with your healing balm, console the sorrowing, visit the prisoners, and welcome the stranger. We pray for these things in your name. Amen.
Amen. As the ushers come forward, let us take a moment to think what we might give in a troubled time during this pandemic in such a strange world when so many things don't seem to be working as they would normally work. So we know that we're called to be there for them, and this is our opportunity. We remind those of you who are not here today that, of course, you can text as well as send a check to the church. Let us pray. Loving Creator, we come to you today with grateful thanks for the gifts and promises that so readily stream in our direction from you. So often, Lord, our foolish hearts are filled with worry and anxiety, and we find ourselves looking at the problem of our supply instead of looking to you as our generous supplier. Your generosity overflows to us. Everything we have is a gift from you. As we bring our offerings to you now, we give back to you from the abundant blessings you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to be seated, and at this time, let's sing our hymn of proclamation, "Greater Grace Greater Than Our Sin, number 365.
Our scripture this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, beginning the seventh chapter, beginning at the 36th verse. Listen for God's word for you this morning. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his plate, place at the table. And a woman at the city, who was a sinner, learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment, and she stood behind him at his, his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. So Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two de debitors, and one owed 100 denarii, and the other 50. Then they could not, and when they could not pay, he canceled the debt for both of them. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then he turned toward the woman and, and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with my tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed me, my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sin, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we continue this uh, sermon series out of the Gospel of Luke. We're looking at different images that uh, reveal to us something of Jesus' nature uh, that, that teach us about who he is. Jesus hid in the commonplace. In an ordinary place, they are gathered together for a dinner. Uh, this is one of the stories that uh, there are accounts of, if you uh, understand it, there are accounts of in each of the Gospels. Um, scholars have disagreed. Some have thought maybe these were four different occasions. Some have thought maybe it was one occasion that each of the Gospels shares in a little different fashion. Others have thought maybe there were two because you can kind of group some of the stories in two. What's interesting is that all four Gospels tell us a story of Jesus being anointed by a woman at a meal in which disciples, followers, friends of Jesus are all gathered. The setting is the same, although uh, some of the, the situations differ and change. There's a dinner in which they're gathered together. There is a host. In this case, uh, our host is Simon. Not Simon Peter, another Simon, a Simon who is a Pharisee, uh, a, a friend, a follower of Jesus in a way, um, somehow connected and inviting Jesus to dinner. Uh, we usually don't invite those who we are strangers to for dinner, we invite those who we are close to. So there's someone who shares some relationship with Jesus, we would imagine. In each of the stories, Jesus is anointed. In Luke and in John, uh, it is his feet that are anointed, uh, tying maybe to a custom of welcome for those who've been walking across dirty roads and streets to, to wash their feet as they come in and uh, uh, to have them to be cleaned. 
uh, she does this in Luke's account with her tears and wipes them clean with her hair. In Matthew and in Mark, in each of those, the, the woman who anoints Jesus anoints him over the head, pouring out uh, the ointment, the uh, alabaster jar or the nard and uh, other settings uh, are out over Jesus' head. There is an anointing that's part of it. Sometimes connected to Bethany, a uh, region that Jesus knew well. Uh, there, this is a, a, a story about Jesus with those who are close to him, those who are near him. And the woman, uh, in one account, is described as a Mary, and there are a number of Marys in the Gospels, as there are Simons and Peters and others, Johns, um, not necessarily knowing exactly who it is. In that case, in John's account, uh, it happens in the home of Lazarus. Uh, and in all accounts, there seems to be a prefiguring of Jesus' death. Jesus is anointed by a woman. In one case, in, they're at the feet, in the other, at his head. Even in this one where it speaks of Jesus, anointing Jesus' feet, it says she stood behind him. Their custom would have been to lounge on cushions around a low table, and so she would have come up behind him, standing over him in this way of, of recognizing Jesus. Clearly, anointing Jesus is an act of love. Uh, you can see uh, from the, the woman in this account, she bathes his feet with her tears, such great love poured out, and then to wipe his feet clean with her hair. An act of love and of grace. It's also interesting because as she anoints Jesus, she ministers to him. Can you think how many times in the Gospels we have a story where Jesus is being cared for someone else or cared for by someone else? It doesn't happen very often, does it? He is the one who is the actor of care. He is the one who gives care to everyone else. The stories of Jesus are so full of it. Uh, where he is either teaching or he is having compassion. Remember, there was an account where they were going to go across the, the, the lake to the other side because they needed to get to a deserted place to, to rest and to recuperate. And as soon as they get to the shore, the people have already recognized that he was coming and they were there in need of rest. But what is it that Jesus does? It says he immediately has compassion on them because he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. He becomes the shepherd. He becomes the caregiver. But in this story, it's exactly the opposite. Jesus comes to a meal, and this woman pours out care for Jesus. What would it have been like for him to receive that, to receive this gift that she offers? Um, a friend of mine from Candler, she was the dean of the chapel at the time I was, was there, and uh, later became, a, 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 well, through that time, a close friend, Helen Pearson. Uh, she wrote a book kind of on different accounts of women in the New Testament. And she writes this paragraph about this moment with this woman and Jesus. It was the woman, not Simon, or the male guest and disciples who was doing, acting, caring, touching, anointing, giving and risking. And Jesus accepted her silent act of intimacy and devotion with profound respect and reverent silence. Perhaps Jesus longed for the warmth of comfort of another's touch, perhaps the cool ointment cascading over his head and over his face and neck was like a baptism of sorts. Perhaps this tender act of mercy brought healing to his heavy heart. Perhaps, just once, it felt good to receive, to sit and be passive, to let someone minister to him. Perhaps to be cared for and loved was a balm to his soul. Perhaps this anointing was an act of emancipation for both Jesus and the woman. Jesus was not ashamed or embarrassed or defensive. He did not rebuke or resist or reject her. Rather, Jesus affirmed the woman for who she was 
and for what she did. Such a beautiful moment for Jesus to have oil anointing him, cascading over him to receive. The anointing was not understood by his followers. It was not understood by those around him. But it was something that was understood by her and it was understood by Jesus. The anointing prefigures Jesus' self-giving, his giving his life for all of us. She alone understood that he was headed to his death and she alone acted and behaved as though she understood where this was leading, was anointing him for his death, preparing him for his burial, understanding that he was giving his life for all. The word Messiah, translated into Greek, Christ, uh, means a very simple thing, the anointed one, the anointed one. She is the one who makes him Messiah. It wasn't the disciples. It wasn't a priest. It wasn't a male prophet. She's acting in a prophetic role, anointing him as the Messiah. Love poured out in great generosity. She has great love because she has been loved greatly. It's interesting. Simon has such difficulty understanding that. Maybe because he feels like he stands on his own. Uh, I think we have a tendency in the U.S. to want to have our story to be that we stand on our own. We pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. But it is Jesus who pulls her up and gives her strength. Something that's hard for Simon to understand. When we have been forgiven much in our lives, we are able to understand great love and forgiveness. I used to kind of think that of myself. I thought the compassion of Jesus was really for those who really couldn't handle it on their own until I realized how poorly I handle it myself. I would like to think I handle things well, but indeed we all are reliant upon God's grace. And when we have such realization, we understand the depth of love. We can get caught up in all our conventional views, their views of women who would not be at the table, their view of this woman as an outsider, as a sinner, views that would normally place people into boxes and let us handle them easily. But what Jesus is always seem to be operating from is that he's not operating by the boxes of our normal culture. He operates by one principle, love and grace. Grace poured out. And he's not mean to Simon either, as he corrects Simon, does he? I mean, he, he brings Simon closer, I think. He gives Simon the opportunity at the close of this meal to welcome the woman as guest. Simon has the opportunity. It's, it's all in his hands. It's all in her hands. It's in our hands how we choose to respond. She loves greatly because she has been greatly loved. She does what she has the power to do. She steps in and she anoints Jesus as Christ because of his love and his grace poured out to her. We remember today and are challenged to do what we have the power to do. In our lives, it may be little or it may be much, but that's not the question. The question is, when we do what we have the power to do, it is always more than enough as God enables us through grace. Amen. Let us join together in our prayer of brokenness and confession. We have hidden impure motives behind pious words and covered flesh with good works.
that draw attention to ourselves rather than the gospel. We have ignored your law as if it did not apply to us or tried to keep its letter without being changed by the grace and power of its author. Forgive us, we pray, and save us from this way of death. Amen. God forgives and makes new. God sends water to refresh us and food for our spirit. Come home to God with shouts of joy, for the harvest of salvation is ours. Let us stand and take a moment to greet one another with signs of God's love and peace. Let us join together in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity and made covenant to be our sovereign God and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. 
Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he broke the bread, he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks to you. And he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many. Do this in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at your heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning we will be coming forward to receive communion. You'll be given bread and juice to eat and to receive. We invite you to receive those in uh, God's grace and God's love as he calls you forward. We'd like to invite those who will be assisting to come forward at this time. And then we will come forward at the usher's directions.
Our closing hymn this morning is Soldiers of Christ Arise. Let us stand and join together in singing. Join with me as we join together in our sending forth. When we see the body of Christ still broken in this world, go in peace.